Hi, everyone. My name is Tiffany Conklin. I'm the executive director of Portland Street Art Alliance. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, based in Portland, Oregon, but serving the entire Pacific Northwest. Uh, Alex, do you want to introduce oh. yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. I wasn't sure when I was supposed to come in. Uh, <laughs> my name is Alex Chu, and it's an honor to be here to um, introduce a little bit about what I do. I'm a professional muralist. And I've been doing that as a full-time job for about five years, and I specialize in community mural work and community engagement. Um, my, name is, <laughs> my name is Sarah Sill, and I work with Portland Street Art Alliance. I assist Tiffany in a whole bunch of uh, things. So um, anywhere from helping to make murals happen to some back-end web stuff and all kinds of things. Uh, as a small nonprofit, we... Uh, are scrappy, which is what you kind of need to be in the arts industry. Uh, so <laughs> just a lot of fun. All right, so Courtney, can you go ahead and load the presentation, please? Awesome, sharing my screen now. Let me know if you guys can see this okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Nope. Maybe just go to the slideshow. Yeah. The Sorry, it's in the <laughs> corner. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> Woo. Yay. All right. All right. Well, I think I'm supposed to get us started here. So thank you again all for uh, being here today. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we are Portland Street Art Alliance. Uh, we uh, focus primarily on mural work. Um, so both indoor and outdoor murals. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, live painting activations for events. Uh, we do public education, like what we're doing today with presentations and workshops. And a big part of that is also our tour program, which was on hold a bit for COVID, but we are gearing it back up for this spring and summer. Uh, Sarah, could you flip uh, next screen? or Courtney, whoever's doing that. Uh, so um, Portland Street Art Alliance has been um, around since 2012. We incorporated four years later as a nonprofit in 2016. So this year actually marks our 10th year um, in existence. Uh, we started out, as Sarah mentioned, uh, pretty scrappy. We still are. Um, but we came together more um, to advocate for the artists uh, that were in the community and to try to improve um, some situations that we were seeing happen. And we just thought that there was a need for greater uh, discussion and education around some things like the mural permitting laws in Portland, and just that there was a lot of room for improvement um, on that front and that we could help be kind of an intermediary between uh, the artist community, city government, and at that time, the police and graffiti abatement were a bit more of an issue as uh, than they are these days. Um, but we were really trying to be an in, uh, intermediary uh, between those entities. So our mission uh, is advancing street art culture by empowering artists to activate the spaces where we live, work, and play. So all of our programming uh, really tries to focus on making that happen. Uh, next screen. And uh, just a little bit more about that. Um, we really are aiming to transform his Portland and the Pacific Northwest into a world-class public art destination. And by doing so, um, a broad diverse and network of artists are empowered to take uh, creative and expressive risks and um, help uh, uplift our community spaces, uh, both visually, socially, and economically through public art. Uh, next. <laughs> Right, and just a quick overview of uh, the folks involved. So uh, we have a board of directors. All nonprofits have to incorporate with at least three directors off the bat. So um, really this was uh, Tomas and I's um, baby of sorts. Uh, we um, came together as friends and we really wanted to make some change happen and uh, be um, at the forefront of that. So we came together to create Portland Street Art Alliance. Uh, he has his background in arts administration from the University of Oregon, and he's now a producer by day, um, working with a local uh, agency to make videos and ad campaigns for, for big companies. Uh, he's still involved in the very much the day-to-day -day activities as well, um, just really kind of helping guide the ship 
Uh, we also have Galen Malcolm, who is a practicing street artist in Portland for many decades. Um, he really helps um, be our liaison with both the street and the graffiti art community um, in the region. Um, and helps us with a lot of day-to-day uh, -day activities on the grounds, mural maintenance, mural logistics, lifts, that sort of stuff. Uh, Hunter Chauvet is also on the board. Uh, he is a professor of geography at Portland State University, um, my old thesis advisor and professor, so really um, got me into this um, on the nerd side of things and focusing on public space, the politics of public space and uh, viewing public space through the eyes of street art and graffiti is a really interesting um, activity. And finally, our most recent um, addition to the board of directors is D'Angelo Rains. He's an event producer and DJ um, in Portland. Uh, very um, much, you know, finger on the pulse of the creative community and the music community and art communities. So really a perfect trifecta um, comes along with uh, D'Lo. He's um, really um, pushing it with a lot of different really cool events in town. So be sure to try to check out um, some of his events and his DJ uh, spots are really great. Uh, next. Oh my, okay. <laughs> um, so oh, if you could, did we go? Okay, so this is the next screen. Um, so uh, just a little overview of our programming. Um, if you could back back up, I think we, we went past too many. <laughs> Well, I think it's on like automatic right now. Oh, Sorry, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like going by itself. Sorry, one second. No worries. <laughs> it's like I can't talk that fast. <laughs> okay. It's just doing its own thing. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the correct one? Uh, if you can move uh, forward two more, maybe, I believe. There we go. Oh, about me. Okay, I'll make this one quick. Uh, so yeah, I um, I got my master's degree from Portland, uh, Portland State University uh, back in 2012. Um, I focused on uh, urban studies and previous to that I had a background in cultural anthropology and sociology uh, from the University of South Florida. And like I mentioned, when I came to Portland State University, I luckily found Hun uh, Dr. Hunter Chauve uh, in the geography department. Um, and he really helped me um, create my own specialty focus area of public space uh, within the urban studies and planning department. So that was really great. And I um, completed my thesis on uh, graffiti and street art, basically looking at different public perceptions of those things. Um, okay, next. <laughs> and Alex, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alex. And um, yeah, this is just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a Chinese American painter. Um, I came here from, I grew up in Orange County and uh, did some artwork in Los Angeles until, and we moved here in 2012. And I really got into murals in 2017. My first big project was with TriMet. And ever since I worked with TriMet, I've been um, a full-time muralist and uh, trying to do as much as I, I can. Um, what I do involves um, community engagement and it's important for me to represent the communities around me and tell other people's stories in my work. Great. Next, okay. And just a little bit more about um, all the different types of things we did. Uh, we do, like I mentioned, um, primarily our activities are around murals. We also do live painting. Um, we're getting a little bit more into digital art commissions. So things like, um, you know, illustrations for magazines, things like that, uh, car wraps, um, truck wraps. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a community art program um, that is a donation and grant supported uh, program that mainly focuses on uh, creating uh, productions with a large team of artists on abandoned and dilapidated buildings um, to help uh, support more um, easy access to public art uh, spaces in the community. And um, like I mentioned, we also do public engagement. So that's tours, presentations, and sessions like we're doing today. Next. Great. And then um, we have a very large artist roster at this point. It's kind of hovering around 250 regional artists. Um, we are constantly adding to that roster. Um, it's very easy to um, apply, so to speak. Um, simply send us six to eight work examples um, of your preferably large scale work. Um, we, like I said, primarily do murals. So large scale is key and um, that 
is okay. If you're not there at that point, you can still reach out, share your work samples, and we can kind of put you in the lineup, uh, most likely for smaller community projects to give you space to practice scaling up. Um, we also really highly recommend just doing uh, little things like getting pieces of plywood and trying it out. Um, but really, um, you know, we've seen a lot of artists grow and get bigger and bigger with their work. We've also done a lot of initiatives to try to make sure that our artist roster is as diverse as possible when it comes to uh, BIPOC communities, um, LGBT plus communities, and rural artists have been our main uh, focus area, um, in addition actually to female identifying artists. Um, as a female-led nonprofit, that's super important, especially in a male-dominated uh, community, uh, like the graffiti and street art community uh, used to be. It's definitely changing these days though, so that's great. Uh, next. All right, so we are going to dive into uh, the bulk here of the presentation, which is um, going over how to scale up um, and paint a mural, basically. So we're gonna go through a process overview here. Um, if you could click next, I think these are gonna pop up. You could just kind of click through all of them so we can see, and I'll talk through some of these. Um, but basically, this is an outline, which you're also, um, you have access to getting a one-page uh, flyer of sorts that we created, a one-pager, that is going to go over the same type of overview. So this is just kind of going quickly over the things that we're going to cover today in this presentation. So we'll just kind of breeze through this and get into the presentation. All right. So now, all right, we're getting into the, the meat of it. So one of the first things you have to consider when painting a mural outside in public space is getting the right permissions. Of course, many people don't get permissions and that's what people tend to call graffiti. Um, but we, um, as a nonprofit, of course, um, promote trying to get permission from somebody to paint before you do it. So that changes depending on what kind of space you're looking at and where you're at. So different cities and different towns have different rules and laws about these things. So first and foremost, you want to get permission, of course, from the person who owns the property. You might also need permission of the business owner. So um, we suggest getting out there on foot is a really good way of doing that. Just start small, find a little local neighborhood place, ideally that you actually maybe know the person that owns it or the people that work there. And get a small wall and go from there. Have your sketch in hand, have, have some printouts of your portfolio, um, whatever you need to do to easily show them what you are capable of and try to get them to agree to let you paint something. You might also need to get uh, tenant notifications or neighborhood association notifications um, from, from those entities. Um, and those might be wrapped up in some of the next things coming up too. So if you're in the city of Portland, uh, we do require mural permits here in the city. So you have two options for those things. You can get an original art permit from uh, the Bureau of Development Services, which is the acronym BDS. Um, that's the most simple and straightforward route. So that costs $56 these days, so far cheaper than it used to be, luckily. Um, it does take about one month to do the process. Um, it's kind of just putting in a simple application with a site plan, um, a very brief description of what you're planning to do with what types of medium, medians, mediums, um, they actually do not require a sketch. So you do not have to have your mural planned out to that point when you apply for a mural permit. So really you're just getting permission to paint a mural. The city of Portland cannot regulate content. So all they need to do at the end of your mural um, is get a photo of it just to make sure that it's meeting the requirements of the city in terms of not being an advertisement and um, that you know, you've checked all those boxes and then your permit is issued. You have another option to go through RAC, the Regional Arts and Culture Council, which is kind of essentially the city's art department of sorts, but they are a completely separate entity from the city of Portland. So RAC provides a mural permit waiver. So what that means is that basically RAC is issuing you a waiver from getting the BDS permit. And the reason you might wanna go through RAC few things, you might want to try to apply for matching funding. Um, a lot of people 
there, you know, ears perk up, matching funding sounds great, but I do put in a word of caution that that, co- that funding is very limited. Last I heard it was around 60K per year, and that doesn't go very far when you think about how many artists and how many murals are being painted and how expensive murals can be. So it's really, really competitive. Um, I think they have a max per project of either five or $10,000 as well. Um, and you go through a design review process. So you definitely need to have your design in hand. You have to create a proposal, submit your timeline, your full budget. Um, it's kind of like applying for a grant basically. Um, and that process takes anywhere from six to eight weeks. So equal, about equal to the BDS permit, but actually a little bit longer. Um, you can apply for the RAC permit once a month on the final Wednesday, I believe, or the second to final Wednesday of every month. So there's also you know, parameters around when you can apply. So you really got to plan ahead for that one. Um, if you're not asking for matching funding, um, the RAC permit um, waiver is pretty easy to get. You're not going to be under as much scrutiny um, you know, about your design and stuff if you're not asking for matching funding. So they can just issue you a waiver without the funding match. Um, and what's cool about the RAC option is once you go through that, your mural is part of the city's official public art collection. So that's a pretty cool thing to have in your resume. Um, since we're presenting here with the city of Beaverton, we thought we'd mention that Beaverton Arts um, does have a program um, that um, basically your application um, that you put into the Beaverton Arts program is reviewed by the Public Art uh, Selection Committee. Um, and there was a note on the website at the time when we made this presentation that no matching funding was available at that time, but it makes me think that you should probably just kind of keep checking back at that since it sounds like maybe sometimes there is. So we provided some links in the presentation there to learn about Beaverton system. So basically all you need to know is that each city is different. You should check the laws before you paint unless you want to take the risk of painting with without permission from the city or whoever is um, governing that area. All right, next. Okay, I think Alex, this is you. Um, so uh, I feel like we're, we're bouncing back and forth. Um, Tiffany's gonna be talking about her work with Portland Street Art Alliance and I'm here to cover the basis of what it's like to uh, be an artist and um, figure out how to take what you're good at and then try to work and, and do public art and some tips that I have. Um, I, I guess in the beginning, Tiffany, did you want to do yeah. these two points? Yes, thank you for reminding me. I'm not seeing our notes here. Um, so yeah, so when we get started, when you know, for us, it's when a client reaches out. Um, but basically, you know, when you secure your wall and you know who you're talking to, and you know the person that is either owning the building or the business, um, you want to think about creating a scope of work. So like, you know, in many, many industries, you have a scope of work when you have a contract for services like this. Um, so you want to just kind of think about like all of those things that you would normally put in like maybe a grant proposal or something like that. You want to think about your timeline. When is this happening? Um, what's your budget? When are all those line items? Um, where um, you, you're painting, all of those site considerations, what's the wall like, you need those measurements of the wall, you need to know what the wall quality is, you know, are you painting brick, are you painting drywall, does it need to be primed specially, um, or prepped in any sort of way, so you just want to kind of start thinking through all of those steps, and it's really good to start just making a checklist, because you'll come to find out that most murals are going to follow that same line of, um, that process line. So um, you're going to use that scope of work again and again, and it kind of can start serving as your template for mural, mural jobs. Part of that process is helping the, the client or the business owner or property owner figure out what they want painted. Sometimes you get the super cool person that is like, paint whatever you want. You have open creative freedom. Amazing. Sometimes they want a little bit of direction, um, you know, be able to provide a little bit of direction for your mural. And other times it's really a work for hire that you are creating a mural that is trying to actualize something that they're envisioning. And that's always the hardest part, right? Um, so that definitely takes some practice. But one of the key things that we figured out that's a really good thing to ask people up front to create for you is a mood or design board. So you see this a lot in like design industry. Um, 
you know, projects. Basically ask them to collect a couple photos, like a collage or something like that, of things that they like, other murals that they like, other artwork that they like. This could be a mood board for content showing you different types of things that they might want depicted in the mural, or it could be more on the mood and the vibe side of things, just different types of color schemes that they like, or different types of textures and designs, and just really going in that direction. So it could be kind of a combination of both things. But once you get that, that will help you start visualizing what they might want you to paint and what they're going to be happy with. Um, so managing uh, communications and clients and um, expectations, it's really important to have contracts up front. It took us many, many years to develop our contracts and they are a work in progress. And that is really our go-to of outlining everything that is expected out of each party. And I promise you, you wanna do that up front and have that laid out ahead of time because when those problems happen, it's a lot easier just to point back to the contract to what everybody had agreed to sign off on. Um, so you really got to try to manage that the best you can. All right. Um, and Alex, I think I may have uh, verged into yours. So please um, echo or add to whatever I just said there for that third. Yeah, third. no, everything that you said was great. <laughs> and um, I feel like I'm just going to continue what Tiffany has been talking about. Um, I think being an artist and working with clients is going to be a new experience, especially to a lot of um, emerging artists or people who do their own work. And in a lot of ways, when you do your own artwork, it's usually in private because you're developing your skills. You're trying to figure out how to be proud of your own work. And um, it feels really good to have um, someone come up to you and be like, hey, I'm going to give you a shot. I'm going to let you use our wall and then um, do something for us that everyone's going to see. But um, this is difficult because um, and I know people are here for different reasons. There's people who are here who might want to hire an artist to do a mural for their business. And, and um, there's going to be people who want to do murals um, on a regular basis and they want to get paid too. So um, I want to kind of address that. Um, when you meet with a client, it's good to establish a relationship. In, in a lot of ways, it, it's probably good to know the people already um, that you're working with. Um, and, and you might be working with strangers right off the bat, but it's really good to have that open amount of communication. And for anyone who's hiring an artist, it's important to look at their portfolio and really understand the type of work that they make. So when you look at what they've done before, it's good to have an expectation that it's probably going to look like that when you um, have a finished product. Um, so part of being an artist is being able to um, say like, okay, I know that uh, you're really into Picasso murals or uh, I don't know who the biggest uh, Diego Rivera, you know, and, and I love these murals with like a thousand people in it. Um, it. Part of the job of being an artist is to say, hey, you know, based on how much time it takes me to paint, how big it is, like how much materials we have to buy and what the budget is you have to explain to them what you're able to do. So it's good to think about that beforehand. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be excited that you have a wall, you want to paint 100 people, and um, it's impossible. So a, a lot of your communication with a client is to understand how to explain what you can deliver at the budget that you have. Um, and one way to do this is community input and workshops. And this is something if you're hiring some, someone to do a mural for you and to get feedback from the community and work with the community, it's good to know that that's extra work. Because in a lot of ways, um, everybody wants people to paint with you. It's like, oh, for an elementary school, we want the kids to paint and we want everyone like these, we want 10 people to be featured in the mural. And sometimes that's a lot of pressure on an artist if they are just used to doing their own artwork and um, they're not used to incorporating ideas. So um, one way to figure out a balance of what the client wants to see and what an artist wants to do is to do workshops and have creative input uh, to process all that. Uh, I do encourage if there is a long community engagement process to pay an artist more for that process. But if they already have the design done and you know what they're going to paint, then that's also very helpful uh, to know. And then uh, another aspect is collaborating with other artists. A lot of the first projects that an artist might work on might be a collaboration. So there's four or five different artists and they're doing a large wall. Um, it's good to um, know who you, 
have these experiences of painting with other people. Um, it's good to plan it out a little bit or at least have a discussion of where you're going to paint and where another person is going to paint. Um, that way, if people start painting and they paint somewhere that, that someone else thought they were going to paint or if they paint over something, you want to make sure that you have that communication or are in good, like, uh, understand how to deal with artistic collaboration and 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 talk about it. So um, this is something that you should keep in mind if you're on a project with several artists is to make sure that everyone's clear about how you guys are moving forward, how your images are going to work uh, well with one another. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and then um, it's always good to do a sketch. I, I know that it's extra work. A lot of artists who are um, new are like, why do I have to do two art pieces? Why can't I just go to the wall and do whatever I want? Um, and the issue with that is um, sometimes if you freestyle something, it's not what the client expects. And then it causes a lot of problems if you have to repaint or, or move backwards. So to solve that problem, um, I know that artists, some artists don't do that and refuse to do that, but it's always good to be able to do a preliminary sketch so that everyone's somewhat on the same page um, a sketch can also be like bullet points to things like that, but to have a visual representation is, is pretty important. And nowadays with technology, a lot of people can actually put their sketches on the wall or on a picture of the wall. So that's always helpful to kind of see how it lays out and how um, the colors in a space interact with the colors of your mural. Um, I think, oh yeah, there's one more, feedback and revisions. So I think with artists, um, it, it is difficult to hear criticism about your work or if someone has something to say um, and, and, and it's hard, it's like, oh, it took me so long to draw that I don't want to redraw it or I don't want to make these changes. Um, a lot of the process of being a professional artist is um, finding a good medium in between what the client wants and what you want. So um, it's good to uh, be upfront about um, if you're open to doing revisions and how many revisions you might do, my policy is I'll do one sketch. And if they're like, oh, this doesn't work, we'll try again and I'll do one more sketch. And if that doesn't work, then um, and they want to continue to use you, um, then um, I probably would ask for more funding for for the sketch process, because that does take time. So um, if you do three or four sketches, that's a lot of artwork that an artist is doing. So for a client, it's good to keep that in mind if you want to make all these changes. But also, um, I, I give people like small changes that are easy. I, I do my mock-ups on Photoshop. So if I need to change the text or the font, it's easy to do. But um, just keep that in consideration if you're a, uh, someone hiring an artist or if you're an artist to really have your boundaries set on like what you're willing to do for the client um, and, and, and talk about that beforehand. Great. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is just for me to kind of show a little bit of my, my work and talk about how I do um, community engagement and how I reach out to the community. So um, this project in specific, it's a, it's a unique project where I knew uh, I, it was for Davis Elementary School in Gresham. And I knew I was gonna be working with students and I knew that that's what they wanted me to paint. They wanted me to do a, um, to highlight um, the diverse cultures uh, in their school and to kind of um, give, uh, be able to tell the stories of these individual students. And um, so I had collaboration in terms of the concepts uh, as well as, um, folks would model for me so that I had a subject to paint, a reference to paint. And also um, they helped me paint in the end. So this is very, very community intensive. And when you do a project like that and you're a school or an organization, it's good to know that a lot of work goes into that. So if you can pro provide more funding or grant funding for those workshops, it's good too. So I gave everyone a workshop to do in their class. And the prompt was, um, if you were to write a book, what would you write a book about? And then to provide an illustration. So um, this picture over here of this futuristic car that's flying with all these jet packs and stuff, that's actually the drawing of a kid. And he's like, oh, I wanna write a book about futuristic cars. And, um, and I was able to incorporate his drawing. So the boy that's um, cutting that piece of paper, he's the one who drew the car. So I was able to incorporate his artwork with um, with his own portrait and to depict a little bit more of his own story and to tell a little bit more 
um, in, in the in the mural itself. And then in the end, he might have even painted his own picture or, or you know laid down some of the flat colors. So what I usually do is have a process where um, part of the mural um, folks can help um, sometimes, and then um, I might refine it and, and fix it in the end. But again, um, sometimes having folks help you is, is not always helpful. Uh, sometimes it's just giving people an experience to paint with you. And as an artist, uh, it's nice to be able to connect with the community in that way. But just know that um, you might have to fix a lot of work or be patient with people if you're going to have other people help you. And that's another thing you can probably charge more for because um, people like that. People want to be able to in, uh, um, to, to interact with murals in that way. So it's something that you can negotiate, like, can I get a little bit um, more resources because I'm gonna have people paint and I'm gonna buy more brushes and um, just put my energy into that. So yeah, that's uh, this project. Great. So the next slide, um, so I, I wanna give you the best um, uh, re resources that I have. This is my own personal, um, so the next part is supplies. And this is my own personal uh, checklist. And I know that other muralists, they do it differently. And really the budget will dictate what you can use. Um, uh, what's really nice about materials is that some materials, once you buy them for one project, you can use them again for other projects or you'll have paint left over. So um, it's a lot of it is just having your first projects, getting your foot in the door. Um, for me, I was really fortunate to be able to work with um, a, com a company like TriMet and it opened the doors for me to do a lot of projects. Um, but these are these are some of the materials that I would recommend everyone asks, like what paint do you use, what brushes do you use, and I'll just kind of describe them from my own perspective. So for the most part, I don't use oil-based, and I think that a lot of people have stopped using oil-based. I think in a lot of hardware stores, um, people don't even sell oil-based paints anymore. Um, a lot of the acrylic paint that people make is really good and is lasting longer. And there's acrylic paint that's meant for mirrorless. So the best paints that you can buy, in my opinion, would be um, Nova Color paints. Um, there's a company that makes acrylic paints for mirrorless in Los Angeles, and you can order them online. Uh, so Nova Color is what I would recommend. But if you go to any art supply store, there's um, Golden paints um, and Liquidex is kind of the acrylic, the high quality acrylic paints, but you want to get something that's kind of softer body that's not as heavy um, because you're going to be um, doing large, um, you, uh, you, you kind of want it to flow faster. So you're going to want to water down your paints and be able to paint large. So um, Golden sells a liquid acrylic and they sell large quantities of that. But also there's a mural like buckets of gallons of Golden paint called Paintworks. So um, you can research and, and look for mural paints, but I would recommend Nova Color or Golden paints. Um, also, if you get the higher end hardware paint. There's no problem with that. It's meant to be outside. It's meant to be on walls. Um, uh, the difference in quality has to do with um, how much acrylic they're using and how much um, latex they're using because there's um, kind of polymers that last longer. Uh, so if a paint has more acrylic in it, it'll usually last longer and seal against, uh, keep the color more. And also the amount of pigment that they put into the paint makes a difference. So that's why there's cheaper paint and more high quality paint. Uh, but I would always recommend, I mean, I always get exterior no matter what, because indoor or outdoor, I just um, want to make sure that it works out. The difference with that is the elasticity. If it's a exterior paint, the paint is more elastic than indoor paint and it just doesn't crack as easily. Uh, but there, you know, there's different reasons for getting both. And um, I, I would just recommend, I honestly, it's up to you if you use um, hardware paint, um, what brand you like to use. I honestly really like using Bear Paint from Home Depot, but people have different things to say about different things. Bear Paint sells Marquee Paint, which is like their highest quality. And then um, I always support Miller Paint because it's a local paint company. And then um, Sharon Williams is kind of like the standard. They've been around for a long time. So people recommend that paint. And we have something in Oregon called Metro Paint, which is um, recycled paint. So if someone has leftover house paint, they send it to Metro Paint. 
they'll recycle it for you and sell this um, bucket paint that's really cheap and still works really well. So um, I would recommend uh, Metro Paint if you're on a budget. It just kind of smells a little fumey, but it's a it's a good it's a it's a good thing that they do. Um, and so let's see. Another thing to keep in mind. Um, sometimes you might want your paint to be transparent. People have different painting techniques on the wall. It, you might want it bold or you might want it transparent or you want it to flow better. There are mediums that you can use. Nova Color sells gallons of matte medium. That's like, it's like um, all different textures from really thick to really watery, but um, it, it's a good medium to use if you're doing glazes. Um, flow troll is another thing where um, contractors will put flow troll in house paint to extend it and to to uh keep it from drying as fast but floetrol is like a mat is like a paint medium and it just uh, extends your paint longer or you could do different effects with it so that you can get at any hardware store and it's really cheap um and again keep in mind your budget um there's cheap paint and there's there's expensive paint uh and uh you can use all of it if you um, but do keep in mind if you're hiring an artist that paint does cost a lot. So um, on an average project, if I were to buy brand new paint and I knew that I was going to use the paint that I bought, the budget for paint for like a, even like a small wall, like eight feet by 20 feet is probably like 200 to $300. So if you're paying an artist 200 or $300 to do a mural, it's only enough to cover their supplies for paint. That's not even like ladders and tarps and all these other things. So just keep that in mind um, that paint does cost a lot of money and to be uh, ready to pay that money. And sometimes people are like, oh, we'll just use donated paint. Sometimes that paint is really terrible and you have to buy new paint anyway. So just keep that in mind. Um, brushes uh, that you would use, I want to keep track on time because I'm going to talk a lot. I feel like I'm going to try to speed this up. So brushes, you want different sizes. Um, if you go too small, you, you're, what you're, is going to happen is you're going to do too much detail because it's like looking into a microscope. You can always put infinite detail into something. But if you're painting like a 100 foot wall, you want to make sure that you, you paint broadly. So I wouldn't recommend going too small with your brushes because that'll just mean more work. So a majority of the brushes that I use are one inch to four inch brushes. Uh, that's where four inch is just for filling in things fast. You can also use, uh, and then uh, one inch brush is like what I use standard on a regular basis. And once I get into like eyes and eyelashes and those types of things, um, I just get, um, there's, there's nice brushes that you can buy. I like using Prince, Princeton artist brushes. Um, there's all different like acrylic brushes you can use, but it's fine to get like cheap brushes too. You can go to Blick, Blick and Michaels and really um, it's nice to use cheap brushes sometimes because you can work really rough with it and not feel like you, it, you know, it's so valuable that, but um, it, you can use a mixture of expensive and cheap brushes. Um, and stain brushes, like I didn't learn about, and th that's probably for coating something with clear coat. Um, sometimes instead of using a roller, you wanna clear coat it with a stain brush. And if you have giant fills, it's you, you can get brushes that are like brushes connected to each other and get like a 12 inch brush. But if you get stain brushes, they're for like doing your decks and they're like just like thick, um, four inch to six inch brushes. And those are really great if you wanna get paint on a surface fast. Uh, other things, I just put a checklist here of things to keep in mind. Um, I think that if you get, if you print out the handout that we're going to send out, it might have these, but uh, we'll, we'll send you the presentation. But these are some of the things that I keep in mind. Rollers and rollers trays. If you use a roller, it just fills in things way faster than with a brush. Um, extension poles are great because you can reach something that's like 15 to 20 feet up just using a stick. Uh, and you don't have to always climb a ladder because that that's really what makes it difficult and dangerous to paint a mural. And then um, having tarps, masking tape, uh, something to paint on, paint, put the paint in, like paint cups, handy cups, uh, palettes. Um, I use chalk and carpenter pencils mainly when I sketch. You can use a chalk line. And if you want a straight line that's like 20 or 30 feet long, you can use a chalk line for that. Uh, it, it just pulls out a line and you can snap it on the wall to put check, uh, put, 
chalk on the wall. Um, cleaning materials, I always have a gallon of water on me uh, with buckets and rags. Soap is not always important, but if you're like trying to keep your brush as well, soap is good. Um, there's actually brush combs that you can use to get more paint out of your brushes and reuse the brushes. Uh, roller cleaners that you can scrape. There's these multi-tools that are round at the edge and you can like scrape the paint off of the rollers and save the paint. Sometimes you can scrape like a lot of paint off of your roller. So it's, it's good to just have that um, around and plastic bags. I use plastic bags a lot. Um, gloves, respirators, especially for spray paint. Um, it's good to have a wagon or a wheel, like a rolling utility bin to keep all your stuff in. My, my whole policy is if you want to go to a location, you just want to um, pull everything from your car once. And then it makes it easy. You don't have to go back and forth to your car to the wall. So having a wagon is helpful. Um, a ladder. Um, there's some nice ladders. I, I'm a big fan of the telescopic ladders that just compact really small and then they go up to like 17 feet but they are kind of um, they can be kind of flimsy and dangerous but I love using uh, the telescopic ladders I think the most secure way to paint um, a mural is with an a-frame ladder because it's really stable and you you have more range on the wall if you're on like an extension ladder you're like up against the wall it's hard to get range but with an a-frame ladder you can kind of have more arm range. And then I always bring measuring tapes and a leveler just in case I need to keep something straight or level. And then budget and, and pricing, I just added that in, in there to like think about what budget you have before purchasing all this stuff. Um, you don't need everything, but um, it's, it's good to have these things in mind. Tiffany. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Okay, all right, I guess I'm gonna talk about paint sprayers, which is funny, I'm not quite an expert on this, so please forgive me, I'm gonna give my best shot. So um, we often are painting really large buildings, massive, you know, full city block warehouses. And in those situations, it's absolutely necessary to spray the paint on, the base coat of the paint on. Um, so what we um, have uh, learned over the years is that it's oftentimes easier to just hire a commercial painting contractor. Luckily, we have um, a group in town called the Painter Guys that are actually part of the street art community that we um, subcontract with to do this for us a lot because they are house painters and they are fully versed in how to use paint sprayers. And what we've learned is that they are finicky machines and they actually take a lot of expertise and um, know-how about how the machinery of the machine, you know, the, the inside of the machine works. Um, so I'm gonna go through just a couple quick pointers um, to maybe kind of make you start thinking about using paint sprayers, about when it's good to use them, when not, and the things that you're gonna need to consider if you wanna get into using them because they are really amazing machines that will just, you know, make the process of getting that base paint on much faster when you start getting to really large scale work. So um, they're called airless paint sprayers. That's usually the type you're going to want to get. You can get them at Home Depot. Um, they kind of range in price. On the lower end, you can probably get one for about 400 bucks. Um, they go way up from there though. So thousands of dollars possibly for a really professional one. But for um, you know a beginner, the four or $500 one will be just fine. Um, you have to factor in that you are going to lose up to 40% of your paint. So when you're calculating your paint um, about how much you need for your base coat, um, there's of course square footage calculations to do there about how much paint coverage you'll get per square foot. Whatever that number is, you need to add 40% onto it if you're doing the, the base coat painting with a sprayer because all of those little paint particles are just floating through the air basically. So another thing, I'm gonna skip ahead with the bullet point list here, is if you think about that, that means there's a lot of overspray risks. So all of those little paint particles are floating through the air and you could see paint um, particles go up to 20 feet. So you wanna make sure that there are no vehicles in the area, nothing sensitive that is gonna be ruined by that paint. Um, luckily the paint is relatively easy to get off if you do it quickly, but no one wants to be scrambling trying to clean somebody else's car. <laughs> um, it's not a good situation. So you really do wanna block off your area very well and pick a day that it's not windy. Um, you need a power source. The, um, paint sprayers need something to be powered with. So that could either be an extension cord into the building or uh, hooked up to a generator. 
Um, you need a lot of five gallon buckets. So at least two, because you need what they call a slot bucket for kind of excess paint and stuff that you're kind of running through the paint sprayer to clean. You need a water bucket and you might want an extra bucket or two just for extra capacity with those things. Uh, you do need a water source. Um, so um, like I said, you need a bucket full of water and you might actually need several buckets of water because throughout the process, you're gonna have to clean your paint sprayer with that water, um, possibly a few times throughout the day. You need a paint strainer oftentimes. So but when you get a large five gallon bucket of paint, um, not all paint is created equally. So sometimes some of the paint has kind of dried on the side of the bucket. And then when you start stirring it up, those pieces of dried paint are gonna start getting you know, moved around in that bucket. And if you think about it, the thing that you're putting into the paint, it's like this, you know, hose with this strainer that's going to be sucking the paint up. Um, what's going to happen is if you have any chunks of dried paint or any debris in there, that's going to start clogging your hose. And that's when you start really running into problems. So they create these little paint strainers. They're like 50 cents available at Sherwin-Williams Home Depot. Grab yourself a handful of those. And basically um, you would use extra buckets and you would pour, you'd put this, the, it's almost like a hairnet and you pour the paint into another clean bucket to make sure that your paint is totally strained through and there's no big clumps and dried things in there. It's really good practice if you're using a paint sprayer to have extra parts on hand and specific tools. So professionals that will have an entire toolbox full of stuff that's just used for paint sprayers and they have that out there with them. And I will say every single time we've used a paint sprayer, we've had to bust out some sort of tool or go running down to Miller Paint and ask them for help um, because inevitably things will break. Uh, you wanna do extra um, precautions with masking everything off. Paint sprayers are releasing a lot of paint all at once. So if there's anything like security cameras, uh, windows, all of that needs to be masked off and protected before you start. Um, another really good thing is to have an extension roller um, with a, a roller on it, um, a roller pad, um, because you want to maybe do some what they call back rolling. So when you're spraying the paint, it's not going to go on super smooth sometimes. It might start dripping down. So basically, it's like a multi part process of spray it down and then come back in with that roller and smooth it out real quick if you have any drips going on. Um, cleaning your paint sprayer is absolutely imperative. Um, there's special um, cleaner that you can get, but for the most part, you, you can just use water. Um, you're probably gonna want hose access if you can, so you can really flush that paint sprayer out really well. Um, but getting a couple five gallons buckets of water will do okay if you're out of sight, but you don't have water access. You wanna clean that paint sprayer until you see no pigment coming through the paint. You know, what's coming through that paint sprayer should be water at the end of it. Um, there's this special blue liquid you can get that um, you put in the paint sprayer afterwards that kind of just keeps everything nice and looped up in there so it's ready to go for the next time. Um, so I also recommend getting that special blue liquid as your final step into your paint sprayer and let that sit. So that's it, really important to do if you're intending to let your paint sprayer sit for any length of time. If you're planning to use it tomorrow or next week, you're probably okay without putting that blue liquid in it. Um, yeah, so if all of that's overwhelming, I don't blame you. Um, it's overwhelming for us a lot of times too, and that's why we often um, hire professionals to do that piece for us. All right, next. All right, site evaluation. So with any project, no matter how big or small, you're going to want to go look at what you're dealing with. So pictures can help at first over email, but you really want to try to get there to go look at the wall. Um, you want to see the space. You want to see what obstacles are in the way. If, you know, objects and furniture need to be moved, you want to see um, what the wall surface and condition is like. So we get a lot of buildings where it's not so great. That's sometimes why they want a mural is because they see that as a way of getting around painting their building. Um, so basically, Basically, you might come into a situation where you have a lot of peeling paint, dried, cracking paint. Maybe your paint is basically chalk because it's just been, you know, inundated with UV rays for decades. Um, so you, you will get variety of situations. So it's good to have in your arsenal on things like wire brushes, uh, paint scrapers, and some heavy duty um, exterior primer paint to do those patches, basically. Um, if you're scraping and you're getting down to the raw wall, you're going to want to put some heavy-duty primer on there um, to patch that in before you even put your base coats on. 
You want to think through site logistics. So things like where are you going to put your supplies? You want those as close to your wall as possible. Are they going to be safe? Are they locked up? Um, you want to think about um, notifying neighbors that all this activity is going to be happening. Um, the worst thing is, you know, nobody gets notification. You show up, you've got heavy machinery there, you're spraying paint, and everybody is blindsided by that. So you want to just make sure everybody knows what's going to expect their what to expect. Um, you want to look at um, how you're going to access the walls. So that kind of ties into what Alex was saying about the ladders. If you're working with a smaller wall, you can use ladders. So just pick the ladder that you're most comfortable with. Um, but a lot of times, um, as you get bigger and bigger with these things, you're going to need a lift. You're going to need either a scissor lift or a boom lift. And that's a whole kind of another ball of worms that we're, or can of worms that we're not going to get into in detail, but um, the way we learned is just call up the rental place and start asking a lot of questions. Um, you are gonna need OSHA certification for using those things. Uh, there's a company um, up in Vancouver, Washington, uh, it's called City, and they offer uh, bi-weekly trainings that are really cheap. They run about $120 a person, um, and they will certify you in a matter of like three or four hours for OSHA um, to make sure that you understand how to properly use a lift and um, always safety first with those things because they are very dangerous and uh, accidents do happen. And if you're up that high and it's an accident, it's just compounded. <laughs> um, so be really careful and always have your OSHA certification in place if you're up there doing that sort of thing. And make sure you have things like a harness, a really good harness is important. You have to have a harness on if you're on a lift. And it's also really suggested that you have a hard hat on as well, because you never know what you might accidentally knock into. Um, you might also need electricity access. Very common um, these days, artists want to do projections, which I think we get into later in the presentation. So you're going to need electricity for that. You also might need electricity for things like your paint sprayer or just small things like charging your cell phone. So kind of think about it that you're going to be at this mural site a long time and many, many hours and you want to try to, you know, make that as comfortable and easygoing for you as possible. Water access is usually needed. If you're using brushes, you need water. If you're using a paint sprayer, you need water. You might even need water because you need to start by power washing the wall first because especially here in the Pacific Northwest, you're not dealing with just dirt. You're dealing with moss buildup a lot of times too. And you just gotta get all of that off before you start. Um, a mural is only gonna last as long as a, you know the quality of your wall is really in many situations. So it's important to not skimp on those wall prep steps. Um, supply storage, like I said, um, it's really important to try to be as close as possible as you can. So as you get bigger and bigger projects, you might even want to start thinking about renting a pod storage container and placing that right next to your wall with a good heavy duty lock and some insurance on it because, um, yeah, that's the, the easiest way to do it when you're doing really big walls. Um, all of those hours lugging your supplies back and forth, um, those all add up. You might need sidewalk permits um, to block the sidewalk if you're doing stuff with machinery or even with a bunch of ladders out. Um, you might, might even need to block the street. So you're then looking at, you know, getting permits from entities like the Portland uh, Bureau of Transportation, PBOT, um, to do those sorts of things. So that um, is something to consider when you're, you're um, you know, impeding that access. Um, the key part to that a lot of times is just making sure that you um, are maintaining a safe space for people to pass through if that is safe. In fact, uh, wheelchairs, ADA accessibility is really important um, and using caution cones and caution tape. So even on smaller scale projects, it's really good practice for artists to make sure everybody's really aware that you're there, you're painting, you're working, put out a couple caution cones and caution tape is really good practice for creating a safe workspace. On. All right, next. All right. I think this is still me, right, Alex? Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think so, but it's overlapping a little bit about what you talked about. So I'm going to breeze over ladders, different types, pick the kind that works best for you. Um, we have gotten into getting those little giant ones that have adjustable feet. So that way, if you're at a slight different um, you know, grade and um, slope, you can kind of adjust a little bit without having to do weird things like shoving pieces of wood underneath your ladder. Um, that just frightens me every time I see it happening. So they make ladders that can have different adjustable feet. Um, highly recommend getting one of those. They are heavy, um, but they can be A-frame and they can be in an extension. They can do all sorts of things these days. 
Another thing a lot of uh, artists will get is a set of rolling scaffolding. You can get um, a small six foot set of rolling scaffolding for about four or 500 bucks from Home Depot. Um, and you can even add to that. You can get up to 12 feet. But if you start going up to 12 feet, you need to start thinking about getting stabilizer feet and uh, safety guard protection rails. There's extra accessories that you can buy to add on to those things. But at the six foot level, you can just go with that basic setup. Mention boom and scissor lifts. Those are what we use a lot when we're working at this scale. Um, you know, like Alex said, going up and down a ladder is tiring. It will wear on your body. And um, I hand it to muralists who are out there every day on ladders. That is incredibly difficult work. Um, you can have scaffolding erected on a building. A lot of clients just kind of jump to this surprisingly, um, but it's actually quite expensive and you need to hire a professional to do that. Um, you know, it needs to be properly anchored to the building. Um, and it's something that usually is put up for a very long work. So if you're doing an incredibly detailed mural and there is budget to support it because it is quite expensive, then you can start thinking about erecting scaffolding, but we, we really rarely do that actually. Uh, swing stage scaffolding is used. Alex is going to get the joy of um, being up on a swing stage scaffolding, what, 10 stories above downtown Portland coming up. Um, so that's kind of like the sort of thing you see window washers on. So they anchor it to the roof and different anchor points on the building. And it's a big swing that comes out over the building. Um, and then it's just basically a button that you press to go up and down, up and down. So that's a really nice, luxurious way of painting a building, um, but again, incredibly expensive. You're usually looking at minimum of $10,000 to set up a swing stage scaffolding set for a month. Like I mentioned, get certified for OSHA and um, make sure you understand everything you need to do to stay safe out there. And insurance is also really important. Um, a lot of people choose to work with Portland Street Art Alliance because we have really good insurance that we um, umbrella cover all the artists that are, we're working on projects with. Um, so that's really great because insurance is expensive. Um, for a small independent artist, um, it can be you know, a bit of a burden um, early on. So um, you know, consider that when you get to the point that you need to have that. Um, we recommend Oliver Insurance out of Canby, Oregon. Um, we were referred to them many years ago by Forest for the Trees, which is another mural making nonprofit that used to be here in Portland. And um, over the years, they've gotten to really understand the business of mural painting. And so they know what we're talking about when we call them up and we need extra insurance coverage on things. So they're great. All right, next slide. Um, I, can, I can handle this one. Um, wall prep. So I think that we talked about this in terms of like scouting the location and understanding location, but some walls are just really bad. And then if you do a, if you do a mural on top of a wall that's like has paint peeling off or moss, it's just not going to last a long time. So I worked on this wall before. So this is an <laughs> example that I have of paint that's completely peeling off of brick and um, there's a lot of moss on it. And um, basically there's just different techniques of like making sure that it's ready to be painted. And the first parts are like washing it. Um, usually a power washing is nice to have no matter what, even if there isn't paint coming off of it because um, the thing that builds up the most is just like street grime and dirt. So power washing, um, even having just like a big um, scrubbing brush with, um, all-purpose cleaner and water is good or rags uh, but then power washing um, there's electric and gasoline the electric ones are not as powerful as the gasoline ones but the electric ones are um, a lot more affordable um, the gasoline ones are more portable because you don't have to have like an like electric source like we talked about um, knowing whether or not there's electric or not um, um, uh, water sources, because if you want to do power washing, you have to hook it up to a hose. Uh, so knowing if that's even there is is a is a big deal. Um, and then just having cleaners and solvents on hand. Um, usually when I clean walls, it's just I just have all purpose cleaner. Sometimes I'll dump a bucket of uh, like a like a thing of all purpose cleaner into my water bucket and just um, scrub with a big um, brush. Uh, scraping is what you need to do if there's uh, flaking paint or mold or if someone's wheat pasted it or put wallpaper on it, you might want to scrape some of that off. Um, you can buy giant ice scrapers that are um, anywhere from four inches to seven inches and they're, they're long sticks that you can scrape the wall with or smaller putty knives 
having a barbecue brush is actually very helpful. Some barbecue brushes have a scraper and the wire brush on it. And you can even sandpaper if you want to get that detailed. Um, if you do have a lot of peeling paint, it's a good idea. There's a product called Zinzer Peel Stop. And I don't know how effective it is, but I've used it before on walls with peels. Uh, if you put it on beforehand on a peeling wall, it's supposed to be able to penetrate and be able to like not have the paint peel off. So um, if there's issues, like it's, it's good to try to prime it um, with that. Next slide. All right. Alex, is that me or you? <laughs> oh, that's you. That's you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not able to see any of the notes on any of my devices here. Um, okay, uh, so ma masking off. Um, like I mentioned, you want to keep paint off things you don't want paint on. So you do have to do that prep work of masking things off. And a lot of artists, I think, just kind of take that step for granted sometimes and breeze over that, especially in their planning and don't realize how long that might take. Um, sometimes it might take a day or two to mask everything off properly before you even start doing any painting. So be sure to factor that in. You wanna protect things like windows, trim, flooring, anything you don't want paint on should have a covering because no matter how careful you are, I will promise you, paint will get on something you don't want um, if, if there's something you don't want around. Um, a handy tool is to have a hand masker. It's like this contraption that you can put the, the plastic masking material onto. And then basically it has a, a piece where you actually then load in your, um, your, your painter's tape. So basically as you move across the wall, you can put this up against the wall and it's both putting your tape on the wall and your plastic on the wall. So once you get really good at using that hand masker, that can really um, help speed things up out there. Really good practice to have just a big pile of tarps and painter's cloths on hands. You can, you know, if you're trying to stay on budget, use old towels, old sheets, whatever you need to do. Um, it's really good to put that on the ground uh, before you start and keep a clean space. You know, you don't really want the look of having a bunch of spilt paint underneath your mural. It kind of just, you know, makes it look a little more unprofessional and people could get mad about that. Uh, priming, like we are saying, is a really important step to consider. There are special primers you're going to need for different types of wall surfaces. So there's different primers for cement, brick, metal is really an important one. If you're painting metal, you do need a special primer on that. Uh, plastic as well, extra consideration in wood. So just depending on your wall, figure out what kind of primer you need to put down on that. Um, and then your base colors, of course. So that's when we were talking about putting, um, you know, getting your paint sprayer out possibly to do that quick, or you can roll that on um, with an extension pole like Alex was saying. All right, next. Okay. Um, so safety and public interaction. Um, I, I, I feel like as, as you do murals, there's a lot of interactions because you're in a public space. And for some reason, Sometimes, I mean, I know there's there's a lot of construction going on. Um, I don't know the interactions that the public has with construction workers, but uh, definitely as a muralist, you tend to have more interaction than if you're just, a, I don't know, probably doing pu plumbing or something in public. People want to know what you're up to. They want to know what you're painting. And sometimes you have to kind of control that as well as just regular traffic in order to keep yourself safe and someone doesn't like run into your ladder and knock you over because yeah, you are doing very dangerous things on a regular basis. So always on hand, it's always good to have safety cones and caution tape and block off a zone that's like meant for you for the public to stay out of. Um, you want to make it visually clear that you're working. So having signage that says work in progress um, so that people um, know that something's happening uh, is important. Um, and then um, if you do get questions, people will ask. There's ways so that you don't have to give them, like, you know, explain too much. Um, having a printed sketch of your artwork is good or an informational flyer so that they can learn the information without having to take up too much of your time because you are working. And if you spend half the time telling people about your project you can't get your job done um and then also if you leave the site to go use the restroom or something you want to lock up your stuff i've gotten my stuff stolen twice so like people have taken my entire buckets of supplies like all my paintbrushes um 
stuff like that. And it really sets you back. So um, you want to know that, you know, it's not always safe out in the public. So having a bicycle chain is good or a storage locker um, so that you can just go to the bathroom or, you know, go get food and, and not worry about getting your stuff stolen. Uh, another trick, this is kind of a trick of the trade, but if you're out there and you're just like, I have to get through this project, I can't talk to anyone, just put on some headphones. And then that, and if, if, if someone's yelling at you, you don't have to respond. And it, it's a good prop to just be like, you know, I'm working, like I can't answer everyone's questions. And um, some people even have headphones on without any music, just as a, as a way to have their private space and, and an I indicator that um, you, you're just trying to do your work as well. So we're gonna get into the next slides. I feel like this is what this project was originally about. So this is design transfer methods. And this is kind of the technical aspect of just how you get artwork that's on a small sketch and then make it, make it big. And I just wanna go through these different uh, methods as, as a kind of, it's just a basic introduction, but then it'll give you an idea of how to handle it. So the first one is freehand. And um, this takes a lot of experience and, and it, the people who do this, I respect a lot. And especially if you have your own style and you wanna get good at painting big, some people can freehand a whole mural and the proportions will look great, but it's difficult to do, especially if you're trying to be, uh, do realistic and have realistic details. So there's shortcuts, but sometimes all you have is your hands and your eyes. So um, you, painting freehand is a, a skill that you want to develop. It's like just drawing things in proportion on a small piece of paper. If you master that skill on a large scale, then you're, you're, you have a really good skill set and you can do most jobs. And uh, if you have your own style, then you can paint wherever you are and not have to do too much preliminary work. Um, for people who, you know, are beginning, there's shortcuts. There's, there's, a lot of shortcuts to the point where you don't even have to need to know how to draw to paint a mural. Um, but this is something that a lot of people learn in elementary school. It's a process called gridding. And what it is, is when you do a sketch, you put a grid on top of your sketch that breaks your sketch into smaller squares. And then when you do a wall, you have the squares that correspond with your sketch. So you draw larger squares or make a grid onto the, the wall surface. And then that way you're painting one box at a time rather than trying to figure out, oh, the eye goes here for sure, or the hand goes here. You know exactly where it goes because it goes into this box. And some people can even put numbers and letters on it to make sure that it lines up kind of like Battleship, but it's up to you what is easier to do for yourself. Uh, this is just an example. I was painting a shed and I did like a, a soft yellow color grid, and that made it so that I could paint this, um, this uh, uh, hummingbird and berries easier. Um, and, and so that's the gridding method. That, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, there's some newer forms, and I would actually really recommend this. This came about um, with the use of uh, uh, um, photo editing software like Photoshop, but you can actually superimpose your artwork onto the wall surface ahead of time. And what really helps is if you have reference points. So if the wall has windows or lines or tiles and you line it up with your sketch, you might be able to just paint it uh, looking at the tiles or the textures of the walls. But if you don't have that, you can just um, paint or draw doodles. Some people do letters, some people just scribble shapes or do like cartoony designs. And then you paint on top of the, the, the sketch. If you see in that image there, I have a man's portrait um, and I lined it up with a wall that already has the letters on it. And that way, when I started to, to draw, with, I, I would, be, I would um, line up the letters with what features are on the man's body, like his eyes or his beard or whatever. And then I, it, in the end, it looks way more accurate. It's surprising how good this method is, but it, it ends up being way more accurate than if you were to freehand it or even use a grid. So um, it's, if it, you can use your phone nowadays, you just have to practice and figure out how to make it look as clear as possible. And you can even print it out. 
Uh, and then the last way is projection. I know that a lot of people, if you're old school, are like, this is cheating. Like, you're not an artist if you're using a projector. But a lot of the creative work goes into designing it. And if you have a set design, you want it to look like what you're presenting to people. So projecting it, is, it saves time. It makes it so that, you know, it, the, the client doesn't have to wait as long. Uh, you don't have to be out there for days with the risk of graffiti. Um, you just, projections are a great way to keep proportions. So as a professional, I, I'm using projections more and more as a professional than when I had just started. And um, it's not something that I would consider to be cheating. Um, um, and, you know, you just, what, at, at a certain point, you do what you need to do to get the job done. Um, and you can actually use it stylistically, the way that you layer things or the style that you draw with if you do have a projector. So that's actually a tool that you can play around with. Um, I, I have a method. Um, sometimes your projector doesn't fill up the wall entirely. Um, uh, you can pre-grid your wall and then grid your sketch. And if you line up the grid with the wall, you can actually split your wall into parts by lining up the grid. Um, and that really helps uh, make sure that uh, you can project the whole wall and, and without, without having to be too close because some projections you have to be like 20 feet away. But if, if you section it off with a grid, it's easier to figure out where to project. Alex, we have a quick question. Somebody's asking if you have a projector you like. Yeah. Well, I mean, nowadays projectors have actually gotten a lot more affordable. Um, I got my first projectors at um, Office Depot, and I think I paid like over a thousand for my first one. But nowadays, you can get a really reliable like Epson um, three CCD uh, projector for like around five hundred dollars, and um, they're really bright. You might be able to project during the day sometimes, and um, they're, they're a little bit more affordable. Um, I, I think that nowadays there's really nice projectors that are, uh, what are they called? They're called short throw projectors. Short throw. Yeah, so, I was just about to add that. That was recommended to us as kind of the top of the line to get. Is, so that's the key word there, short throw. <laughs> they're expensive. So yeah. uh, the, 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 <laughs> the cheapest short throw you could probably get is like $2,000. But you'll, you can be six inches from the wall and then fill up a wall 10 feet by you know eight feet or whatever so and then the further you go back it, you can just fill up the wall much better with a short throw projector but mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting because portability sometimes is a thing in accessibility there's battery powered projectors nowadays that that can run like 500 to a thousand dollars um, there's cheap projectors that are like 150 bucks and they work if you do like small sign work or something like that. Um, it's sometimes they're not always recommended because they might like, you know, they're cheaper and they might fall apart. But um, I've always found a good Epson printer is good. And a lot of old sign painters, they, they, they still use their overhead projectors and things like that. So, you know, any, anything that works. One technique that I have is getting a battery pack or a generator. Um, generators are tough, they're expensive, and they're gasoline powered. But nowadays, there's really good battery packs that are like solar powered, and you could hook up a projector up to a small battery pack, um, and it'll, it'll keep running for like four hours. So um, that's something that I would recommend too. Uh, we just purchased a projector, and the one that we landed on was called the BenQ a short throw gaming projector. Um, so that was after doing a bunch of research about what might be the best use for really large scale murals. Um, I guess this one has that capability Alex was saying about, you know, being able to get really far away, really close up, and then it adjusts the, what it's called, maybe like the skew of it. You can do a lot um, with this projector and it's also really, really bright. So um, that's also a consideration is that projections oftentimes need to happen at night. So, you know, you may not be able to get started until nine or 10 o'clock at night in the summertime here in Portland. Um, you might be out there until four o'clock in the morning if you're trying to get that all done, you know, in one night. And what you run into as well is you got to think about your access to your wall when you're projecting. Um, you're going to need several ladders. You're going to need your lift if you're doing, you know, work with a boom or a scissor lift. You're going to need that out there operating at that time, obviously. 
um, projections are usually times to invite your friends. Um, give them a bunch of paint markers. That's what we recommend a lot of times. If you're working outside and you're projecting, chalk is not a good idea. So you want to go get the cheap cheapest little paint markers you can, um, you know, acrylic water-based paint, um, just get white or black, whatever's going to work best for your wall color and, and use the paint markers. Um, some artists will use spray paint for projections. That's obviously fast too, but spray paint tends to be, you know, maybe a little bit more expensive than some paint markers. So just kind of feel out what you're most comfortable with. But um, yeah, that it's, it's a lot of considerations, but a projector um, is a really great tool if you can get into using that. Uh, one suggestion that I have for sketching a big wall is that to use an extension pole. So you can even take a piece of chalk or a construction pencil and just tape it to like a four foot stick. And then it keeps it from, you don't have to, you know, and you can, you can draw from a distance and look at the perspective from far away and you don't have to climb a ladder sometimes. So um, having like a long stick and then sketching with that is, is helpful to keep proportions as well. Okay, so the next slide is weather. So um, especially with painting outdoors, if you're indoors, it's, it's, it's great. And a lot of people need indoor murals, but this is, these are tips for hot, uh, hot and cold weather. Um, in Portland, there's a, a big range of weather. So, and, and there's a lot of rain. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna give my basic tips. So um, when you paint in the, in the sun, uh, sometimes it's not even having water that's the issue. It's uh, when your water turns hot. So you could be outside and then um, your water's in the sun in a plastic bottle. And then like an hour later, it's just like warm. It's like hot water and it just doesn't, you don't want to drink it. So having cold water is really important. So sometimes you might want to bring a cooler, um, but I just, if you just freeze a gallon of drinking water, it'll just melt throughout the day and you'll have water and it'll always be cold. Um, and that's why it's important also to have an insulated water bottle or a big Gatorade cooler. Um, that way your water stays cold and um, that's really important. Uh, bringing a sun hat, um, you can be out in the sun and just not realize how uh, like fried you're getting because you're, you're just painting. And then um, after a while, you're just like, you, you might get heat stroke or something like that. So having a hat is really important. Even setting up an umbrella, having sunscreen too, uh, just put it on right away before you go out. And that way, um, if, if, you know, you just don't realize how, how hot the sun is until you, it's too late. Then you're like, your skin is all like, it's, it's terrible and you're getting blisters and, and you're like, you're completely dizzy and having a hard time. So having a hat and sunscreen is good. Um, I started wearing long sleeve shirts to avoid um, sun contact um, on, my, on my arms. So you can go to like Walmart and get these thin breathable long sleeve shirts and they're actually meant for the sun. So sometimes having a long sleeve shirt is good. Um, Pop-up tents, like last year, there was just this giant heat wave and it was like 115, 120 degrees. And uh, if I, that it gets really dangerous out there. So having a pop-up tent or umbrella and just being in a little bit of shade is important. And also again, um, not being out for long periods of time and taking breaks helps you realize if you are actually, um, you know, like hurting yourself because you don't realize it. So taking breaks and maybe having an alarm every like half hour or every hour if it's if the weather's bad is good. Um, tips for cold weather. Um, um, a lot of muralists, honestly, uh, there's seasons in Portland for murals. If it's if it's too hot or if it's raining, some muralists just don't work or they just take indoor work or commissions that are uh, like small scale. Um, but for folks that are, you know, they're, they're on a deadline, it's like November and you haven't finished your mural, it might rain a lot. So um, there are ways of helping that. Um, you can get plastic tarps and clamps. Uh, it, you have to make sure it's really taut because when it's raining, it's also windy, so it can't be loose. So you want to have like heavy weights or sandbags or cones that you can tie the tarps to. Um, or having a pop-up tent is really good too. Um, if you have uh, zip ties and ropes to tie things down because it does get um, windy. Um, if you use spray paint, and this is something I didn't bring up in the materials, but 
Um, spray paint is probably a big thing. If people have questions about that, I can answer it. There's spray paint for uh, murals and then there's cheaper spray paint, but there's different ways of handling both. It's technique and takes a lot of experience, but using spray paint um, helps in the rain. You can actually paint in the rain sometimes. Um, and um, it, it, it's not as bad as, because if you use water-based paint, as soon as it starts raining, over time, it'll just melt. And then it's really discouraging and heartbreaking when you've put in hours and you're like, I just want to get in a little bit while it's, you know, good weather. But as soon as the rain hits, you're going to lose all of the fresh paint anyways. So um, you might be able to play around with um, spray paint. But um, as soon as it starts to drizzle, just stop painting. Like, it's not worth it. And then you might even want to just, oh, it's starting to drizzle. You better start um, taping like plastic tarp or plastic bags onto the walls to cover your artwork so that it doesn't melt. Um, wearing gloves is good. You might get, if you're using a spray can, it gets really cold and, and you might actually uh, injure your hands if you're, if you're painting it gets too cold. So wearing gloves is good. And then dressing in layers so that, you know, um, it, you don't over, like it can get, you know, oh, I mean, dressing in layers is helpful. That, that's it. Yeah. Like in Portland, wait five minutes and the weather will change, right? So you might have a day, especially in the spring that we're experiencing now where it's really cold, wet and windy. And 10 minutes later, it's hot and sunny out. So it's really just best to be prepared for everything because you never know um, what you're going to get sometimes. Great. Uh, next slide. I think we're getting close to the end. That looks like my slide. Um, so I know we've gotten some questions about protective clear coatings and a lot of people have questions about these. So um, there are mural grade protective clear coatings. Mural grade is the key word there. So not any old polyurethane can go on top of a mural. What's gonna happen with that is it's gonna turn yellow and it's gonna ruin your mural. Um, another reason you don't want to use polyurethane, especially outside, is it's too much of a sealant. You do not want to put polyurethane on the outside of your building because it's going to seal in all of the wet moisture. And in the Pacific Northwest, that is going to affect the integrity of your wall um, and ruin your mural too. So um, that's a big no-no. So they've developed these um, special mural grade protective clear coatings that still um, uh let your building breathe as it needs to and as it's meant to, um, but will help protect your mural. So the reasons you would put a clear coating on are to protect it from vandalism, to protect the painting that you did, um, also to facilitate easier cleaning because, you know, over time, just like that wall when you got there, it was dirty and it had moss on it. Well, your mural is going to eventually get dirt and moss on it too. And if you have a clear coating on it, it'll really help facilitate easier cleaning on that mural. Another really big reason why we suggest clear coatings um, to people is because that will help protect it from UV fading. So if this is a you know face a, you know direct sunlight facing wall, um, it is really important to put a clear coating on there because your mural will fade. Um, we highly recommend um, thinking through if it, it's in direct sunlight, thinking through what colors you're using too. Um, any sort of neon paint is usually a big no-no for outside. Um, that should only be used inside, really. Uh, neon paint is going to pretty quickly, within a matter of weeks or months, turn brown um, or orange on you. So no neon paint outside <laughs> is just generally a good rule of thumb. Um, some artists use the neon paint just to do like a little bit of dusting to make the, the final mural pop and kind of have that glowing effect to get that final mural, knowing that that glowing effect is going to probably deteriorate over time. So it's another little trick of the trade there, but just know that you would not want to paint your mural using neon paint outside. Um, even if you were to clear coat it. <laughs> um, so the clear coating has a lot of uses, but what we like to remind people is that it's not an end-all be-all against uh, something like uh, tagging, vandalism. So, you know, the taggers are still out there. They may still hit your mural, but what the clear coating does is it's basically um, oftentimes a two-part system. So you have these different product options. You're all with the main clear coating is called a non-sacrificial coating. So that means it doesn't come off. Once you put it on the wall, it's meant to stay on the wall. That is that polyurethane-like substance that basically sticks to your mural paint 
and becomes one with your mural paint. Some of the really top of the line products, the world's best graffiti coating that we have on the image here, were actually developed down in California by a nonprofit called Spark, um, specifically to save historic murals that were um, gonna be removed because the mural um, wall was gonna be torn down. And believe it or not, with some special um, you know, skills, they were able to peel the mural off the wall and to save it. Now that's above and beyond. We don't hear that happening very often. I imagine that was incredibly expensive, but that just kind of gives you an idea of how heavy duty this type of material is. Uh, Spark is, is one of the better ones. But also know that most artists and folks are not going to be able to apply that themselves. It is a subcontracted service that is very expensive. Um, you need special gear. It's not water-based. Um, so you need a dedicated paint sprayer that is only going to ever have that product in it and nothing else. Um, it's got to be sprayed in mist mode at the beginning, which means you need full body protective gear. And the weather needs to be perfect, not too humid, not too hot, not too cold. Um, and no wind. So a lot of requirements. So basically we only hire out for that service um, for the, the non-sacrificial clear coating of the world's best graffiti coating, but that is top of the line. So if you can afford it, go for it. There are some other products out there that we're starting to use that artists can do themselves because they're water-based. Um, the best one that we found so far that most muralists are recommending these days are called, it's called Vandal Guard, and it can be bought at uh, Miller Paint or Sherwin-Williams, but know that they don't have a lot of it on hand, so if you need a lot of it or really any of it, it's good practice to call them several weeks ahead of time and place your order ahead of time so they have, you know, adequate time to get that in from um, wherever they're storing the bulk of it. Um, another really um, important thing is to consider the cost. Um, people don't realize how expensive this is. If you think paint's expensive, clear coating will blow your mind at how expensive that can get. So you're looking at anywhere from $85 to $100 per gallon, um, and you need at least two to three coats of it on. So start calculating that out. <laughs> um, on top of that, um, I breezed over this, I didn't mention it, but the second part of that two-part system is called a sacrificial coating. The only reason you'd want to put on a sacrificial coating is if this mural is going to be really at risk of uh, tagging, of vandalism. Um, because what's that, what that's going to do is basically you can lightly power wash your mural and the second coating that you're putting on the sacrificial coating it's a wax coating so when you're power washing that tagging off the mural you're basically just power washing off that wax that has that spray paint or whatever the tag was put on with um, and that just comes off like water basically with a very light power washing it'll take that tag off but the important part is you need to put more of that wax on um, the wax is non-toxic. Anybody can apply it. So, you know, when we have clients that have building maintenance teams, we just recommend have some of that extra wax on hand. When you clean your mural, put that wax back on. Um, you can generally power wash these coatings up to eight to 10 times before you start deteriorating the coating itself. And you might need to start thinking about reapplying the coatings. Um, so it's not a full, you know, full blown, you know, you can't just power wash endlessly. Um, you have to consider that there is a lifespan of that coat well. Um, you would be applying these coatings um, depending on the label. So basically read the label, see how they recommend applying it. The things that you need to keep in mind, um, like I mentioned, the professional stuff is not water-based um, and it needs special um, equipment to be put on and it needs special cleaning. Um, so you need to be really careful about what you're doing because uh, basically it, it comes in a metal container with some skulls and crossbones on it. And if it comes in contact with your skin, or any plastic is gonna start melting pretty quickly. So it is not something to play around with. And um, we, we got into some trouble with like trying to do it ourselves and uh, thinking that spray paint respirators were gonna be enough, they're not. So um, you need really special equipment for that stuff that's not water-based. Um, if it is water-based, you can use a simple little hand pump. Um, you can kind of buy these at any hardware store. A lot of times they're used for putting like pesticides on things or putting stuff on your yard, but it's just a little plastic hand pump thing. You load that stuff up and you spray it on there with your hand pump sprayer. You can use an airless paint sprayer for some of those products too, if you have one on hand. Um, but you could just use rollers and natural bristle brushes are usually best when you're putting on the coatings. Uh, basically, you want to make sure it's all new equipment. With, if you're using brushes, you don't want any old paint in there because you're thinking you're, you're putting a clear coat on it. Everything's got to be really clean at that point. 
it's always important, like I mentioned, that still have a plan for ongoing maintenance. So um, people think I put a clear coat on, I invested that money in, great, I'm good to go. You still need a maintenance budget there because somebody's still got to power wash off that tagging maybe and put more wax on as needed. So like I mentioned, a lot of these things are subcontracted out these days to other people who specialize in that. So um, we like to give the painter guys a shout out. If anybody would like their contact information afterwards, um, we're happy to provide that. There are a couple of street artists that have a commercial painting company here in town. Uh, they're an LLC and certified. There's also GRS, which uh, is Graffiti Removal Services. Uh, they're the contractor that the city uses for removing tagging around town a lot of times, but they also do protective clear coatings. And last time we worked with them a few years ago, they were offering, you know, four free months of maintenance in that too. So that's a pretty cool deal they get. Um, but their services are pricey, so be sure you budget a line item for their services on top of the product cost. All right, next. Um, I did want to bring up the concept mm -hmm. yeah. of, of um, fogging too oh, yeah. with clear mm -hmm. coating. So mm -hmm. basically like some of these products, it's hit or miss. Like nobody's ever like certain about it. Like there's not one product that everyone uses because uh, it, it's actually different in different weather in different part, uh, different surfaces. Mm -hmm. So always test your clear coat, like start, you know, a, a couple hours ahead of time, put it on some dark colors because if it fogs, it'll turn white. And if you if you do the whole thing or half your mural and you ruin your mural, it's just so disappointing, you know? So um, that's something that I would do is test it. And I don't use rollers. I feel like rollers have an ability to aerate your clear coat. So I would recommend using like, like I said, a giant uh, stain brush or, mm -hmm. or a large brush um, to, to brush it on rather than, or a sprayer. Um, yeah. rather than using a roller. That's Great it. points. And that reminded me of something else real quick to mention. In addition to that fogging situation, another thing to keep in mind is it's going to affect the sheen of your mural. Um, if you put just the non-sacrificial um, polyurethane-like substance, the first layer on, your mural is going to be shinier. Those colors are going to pop and be a little bit more saturated than initially. If you put that second layer of the wax coating on, it's gonna go in the opposite direction. It's then gonna have a much more matte finish and a waxy kind of look um, to it. So just kind of know that, you know, that's gonna happen. And like Alex said, test it first, just to make sure there's no surprises there that you really don't want. Otherwise, just keep a bunch of extra paint on hand and be ready to do touch-ups as needed. And uh, coming from an ad administrative side of things, work that into your contract. Have a section of your contract that talks about ongoing maintenance. Who's responsible for it? Who's responsible for what? How much it's going to cost? What the process is going to be? Um, and also uh, making sure that the, the property owner and the client come to you first. As the muralist, you do have artistic copyrights a lot of times. You do have the right um, to be the one to fix your mural first. We've, we've also seen some unfortunate things happen with, you know, hiring any old person to come fix a mural and some really, you know, poor work coming out of that. And it's also kind of against the law. So um, be sure you have that in your contract and lay that all out for the life of your mural. All right. I think we're done. So we saved a little bit of time for Q&A. Is there any questions that we haven't addressed at the end of our presentation now? <laughs> um, there's a question about fading that came up. Yeah, I think if it, if it fades, if parts of the mural fade, it's going to fade consistently. So if you have to repaint UV fade, you probably have to repaint the whole thing. So that's that's a difficult part. Or just the saturated colors. So, but um, that's a tough thing. It's a, it's a big job. If I guess, yeah, if anyone else has any other questions, um, yeah. uh, whether... Uh, it's about like hiring an artist or um, any questions, anything that we did not get to, um, let us know. If you're uh, feeling shy and don't want to um, come on with your voice, you can type your um, question in the chat too. So that is an option. I actually have a question um, that kind of came up. Um, this is such an amazing presentation. I just have to say like, this is decades worth of experience and, you know, an hour and a half and, um, it's just an incredible resource. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, 
uh, I was curious whether um, Portland Street Art Alliance has a mentorship program or if you ever kind of do matchmaking with artists like that might be a little bit more emerging and looking for experience and a more established artist um, so that they can get that experience. Um, because oftentimes it's that like first um, first project that they like they really need to kind of get their footing. So I was just curious whether um, uh, Portland Street Art Alliance has a, a mentorship program or knows of one that would be a good resource for this group. That is a great question, and that's outside of the scope of our organization at this time. Um, yeah. We really um, recommend that artists, when they're getting started, um, identify a few muralists in town that you really respect and that your styles um, are similar. And, you know, are they using brush paint? Are they using spray paint? Take all of those things into consideration and just reach out to them. Um, a lot of them are on Instagram these days. Send them a quick DM message and ask them if they accept mentorships or if they would like an apprentice or a hired assistant. So, um, you know, different artists have different um, preferences. Some really like working loans, some want every working hand that they possibly can get. Um, so it just really, really varies. And it's just really kind of outside of our, our, our capability as a really small nonprofit to do that individual matchmaking like that. Um, we have a mailing list that um, for the other side of things, if a muralist needs assistance, for a mural, um, we always recommend them emailing us the details of that. And basically we'll kind of put out a little ad for them on our mailing list, which is free to sign up for on our website. And it um, is very, used very sparingly. So you don't get spam emails or anything like that. We might send out one or two messages a week, but that's really kind of like a, a you know, a Craigslist of sorts or a, a newspaper ad um, kind of mechanism for little jobs like that. So if a muralist is looking for an assistance, um, we offer that as a, a posting. So going the other direction, at least we can help out a little bit. That newsletter also sometimes will have smaller call for arts. Um, there's a minimum that we can do with PSAA. A lot of times we get calls from other places or just jobs that aren't gonna work out for us to do. And then those we will put out as calls for arts in our newsletter as well. And those are gonna be excellent jobs for people who are just starting out and really wanting to learn the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of other people doing things like that, I would say always keep an eye on RAC, the Regional Arts and Culture Council that I mentioned earlier that you can get a mural permit waiver from. Um, they also do a lot of educational stuff. So that's, you know, uh, they have a lot more support and staff to do those types of things. And in the past, they've done mural making workshops. Um, I know a local artist muralist here in town, uh, Jeremy Nichols. Um, did a mural painting workshop uh, with spray paint a few years ago. So they used to be offering those sorts of things. So I wouldn't be surprised if um, they start gearing those, um, those types of things up again. Cool, thank you. Um, speaking yeah. of I've... waivers, Alex, I saw a question come through that um, asked if you got photo permissions when you use those real people in your murals and like what kind of forms that you would need to be able to do that. Yeah, most of my murals have always included real people in the community. And really what I do is um, that's part of my community engagement is reaching out to people and asking for permission and doing photo shoots. So even when I started with the TriMet mural, I had established relationships with people who were respected in the community. And that, that was the actual concept of the mural itself. Um, so I would reach out to them. We'd take the time to do my own photography. But all, all it is is just making sure that everyone's on board and not surprised with what you're doing. So a lot of it is just making sure that whatever that you do won't be offensive or won't cause um, someone to be surprised or to, to be depicted in a way that they wouldn't want to. So definitely, I think for my work and the type of work that I do, it's really important that I get permission and reach out to people that I'm, I'm going to, to paint. But I do know that there's a lot of different categories of that. If you paint celebrities, I mean, maybe it's like a whole different ball game, but that's not necessarily something that I do a lot of, but, but also historical figures. Um, it's, it's something that, um, you know, it's just done on a regular basis. But for the kind of work that I do painting community members, I think it's always a part of my engagement process and sketch process to get permission and make sure that everyone knows what's happening. And I've had people say no, 
So I've made sketches before and made mockups before, and they just are not interested in it. And that's just something that you have to um, be respectful of. Thanks. Um, I'm going to address the, the two uh, new questions we got in the chat. Um, Jackie asked about different types of mediums uh, like sculpture and kinetic. Um, I know, um, you know, traveling around Europe, uh, you see a lot of 3D murals over there, which you don't tend to see here in the States as much. Um, it, that's totally possible. Um, we had a, a sculpture artist here in town, Paige Wright, um, do some partnerships with a muralist where she put some of her clay sculptures on the wall and, you know, adhered those to the wall. Um, what you need to consider when you're doing those sorts of things is you are going to have to get a City of Portland permit, and it's a special type of mural permit for that. Um, it's going to require a structural review. So basically, an engineer is going to have to come out to the site one or two times um, to, one, make sure the plan is in place properly for you to make sure that that is attached to the building safely and isn't going to fall and hurt anybody. And then they have to come back out once you do it and make sure that it was done right. So um, that is, last time I checked, about $500 extra on top of the mural permit to do something um, that is coming off the wall, quite literally. Um, the second question um, that it's funny that that's asked, um, it's actually um, uh, somebody was confused about the current image that we have on the screen, um, asking if that was graffiti tagging on the mural or if it was part of the planning and design. And the answer is it was definitely part of the planning and design. Um, we, um, as a nonprofit organization, um, we really want to stay true to the roots of uh, street art and the modern thing that we call street art these days was graffiti style art and text-based, letter-based work. And um, we really try to work really hard um, to help people understand that there's differences um, because there is an art form there. Um, and it, they have taken many decades to refine that, um, that style of artwork and to create beautiful letters and really complex ways of combining and you know separating those things out and adding all of this beautiful effect to it. And if it's done with permission, we 100% support that then. Um, and we want to show the beauty and the value of that style of work. So we actually really specialize in that little niche there of um, blending the two styles together of we will do um, really content heavy based um, stuff on top. Um, that's where you get in. This is a picture of our Central East Side History Mural where we partnered with professors at Portland State University to depict a visual story of the history of the industrial district uh, the Central East Side Industrial District in Portland. Um, so that's what you see on the top of the mural. And along the bottom of the mural, uh, we selected a team of about 16 highly respected regional graffiti artists to paint what we call pieces. That's what that is uh, technically called in the graffiti community along the bottom eight to 10 feet of the wall. And what we've found is that that outreach into the graffiti community um, does wonders um, for the life and the sustainability of your mural because um, there's a bit of a rivalry out there. So not all murals are um, respected by taggers. And if we support the graffiti community and give them access to walls and pay them for their time and uh, value what they're doing, uh, we in turn get respect on our murals uh, more often than not. So we really try to uplift that community and involve them in everything that we're doing. Um, so that is a perfect example of what you see on the image here that we're looking at right now is the coming together of those two styles um, to make something cool that's going to last in the central east side of Portland. I have uh, another we, question if I can. We, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I saw, I, I um, saw a conversation um, the other day about um, whether uh, it was a mural if it was actually like painted on canvas and then attached to a wall. Um, and so the, the sort of the debate was it's only a mural if it's actually painted on directly on the wall surface. And so I wanted to see you guys what you guys thought about that um, simply because it is a way to protect the work and potentially like if the building gets demolished, for instance, um, and it's prohibitive to, you know, um, take it, you know, take it down or um, keep the mural intact that that's mm -hmm. a way to like save it and reinstall it. So I just was curious, like philosophically, what you guys think about that? Um, I can answer that question. <laughs> so yeah. I've been I've been working with different materials and based on um, different 
projects or demands, a lot of people do want removable murals. And, you know, that's like a technicality, whether or not it's a painting or a mural. But if it's, if it's large and you paint it, that's kind of the skill set and the jobs that I get hired for. So what people are using for outdoor murals, there's um, giant aluminum panels called die bond. And that's something that public artists or public art organizations want to use because if you, if the building doesn't, you know, is going to get torn down or if they want to remove the artwork, it's a, it's a good way to preserve your artwork or even like temporary wallpaper type um, or, or um, fabrics is something that people use. Um, something that has been talked about in um, the mural community for a long time is Palon fabric or polytab fabric. And it's a type of um, fabric that you can paint on. And once you adhere it to the wall, it's either like completely permanent or you could use wallpaper paste to make it removable. But um, that is a way that you can work indoors and then transfer the mural onto a surface. And it, it almost looks like it was painted on the wall because it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a thin, lightweight material that um, adheres really well to the wall. So there's different ways of doing murals where it doesn't feel like it has to be permanent. Um, I would not suggest using um, plywood if you're doing an exterior mural. Um, there's some types of plywood that last longer, like marine grade plywood or MDO, which is what um, sign painters use. But um, it's just in the end, that stuff always doesn't last as, as you know, it doesn't have the life as if you were just painting it on the wall. So if it's the difference between plywood or just painting it, sometimes it's good to just paint it on the wall. Cool, thank you. It looks like we had another question about the percentage of murals that everybody puts a clear coating or a graffiti, anti-graffiti coating on. A very small percentage, I'd say, um, mainly due to the cost barrier of it. Um, you know, you are looking for from anywhere from a few thousand dollars up um, when you're looking at clear coating. So a lot of times it's just really a, a cost barrier. Um, so I would say roughly percentage wise, you're looking at less than 5% of murals that at least we do um, as Portland Street Art Alliance will get a clear coating on top of it. Uh, we tend to uh, pick and choose our projects carefully. Um, we're not going to sign on to painting a mural that we don't think is going to last in the placement of where it is in the history of that wall. Um, you kind of need to look at who's using that wall. And um, I would say, um, you know, don't think that you can just paint a mural on any wall in Portland and think that it's going to last. Um, you really have to consider um, who's tagging it, how often is that being maintained, um, what's the history of the area, um, you know, just like, you know, when you're thinking through content, you want to think through that site specificity of um, where you're painting and what's appropriate for certain places and just um, plan accordingly. <laughs> cool. Well, I feel like there's maybe a couple uh, questions that are coming in in the chat. Um, there's one that says, without a protective coating, how long do many oil-based murals last? Um, granted, I realize exposure makes a difference. Yeah, just to clarify, I don't think there's very many oil-based murals out there. So artists are not usually using oil paint, um, especially outside. It's just a drying situation, right? Um, so you're usually using acrylic uh, latex paint outside or spray paint. Um, so um, in general, uh, exterior paint, um, when you're thinking about bucket paint, um, is going to last a pretty long time. Um, you know, Think about how long it would last for your building. Buildings need to be usually painted every 20 to 30 years. Um, but at the end of that lifespan, they're looking pretty crummy usually. So um, a mural is tending to look decent usually for 15 or so years. Uh, spray paint would be kind of comparable um, to that, depending on what type of spray paint you're using and the colors. Um, so certain colors fade more fast than others. So it's just, it really varies. But if you put that protective clear coating on it, what we've been told is that it doubles the life of your mural, regardless of what kind of paint that you're using. So if you can afford that clear coating, it's a really good investment for that reason. I think clear coating is more to prevent like scuffing or graffiti. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like, even if you do it indoor, it's like if you're at a school and people walk by it, you want to mm -hmm. clear coat for the scuffs more so than um, actual fading. Uh, mm -hmm. The fading <laughs> will happen and it'll help to have a clear coat, but I, I haven't even been doing murals long enough to know what the effects of the clear coat are. 
Yeah, and clear coatings, like, yeah, that's a good distinction, Alex. So you're not really worried about fading inside unless, like, for some reason you have a ton of windows and those don't have any sort of UV um, protective properties to it for some reason, like old windows, you know, may not have that built-in protection in there. So usually if you're clear coating a mural inside, it's to protect it from scuffing. So we do a lot, of, um, if we do do clear coatings, it's oftentimes on high traffic areas like restaurants or things like that where we're painting. Um, outside, it's going to get UV faded. Um, we're getting to the point now as an organization, as I mentioned, we're going on our 10th year and our very first mural back in 2012 is on the backside of Music Millennium. Uh, that was painted using all spray paint and very bright colored spray paint. So that is starting to show its age at this point. Um, the colors are more on the pastel side uh, these days. So it still looks cool. It still looks good, but um, it's definitely not the same colors as it was 10 years ago and it does not have a clear coating on it. <laughs> so we have just a, a few more um, minutes. Um, so maybe a couple more questions. There's one here that maybe I can take a, a pass at um, as, as a granting organization. So it's a, um, it says for community grants, do they tend to not support the protective expense or does it tend to throw out the application? And I um, assume by protective expense, you mean the coating? And I would say that it really depends on the granting organization that um, that you're applying for a grant from. Um, for the city of Beaverton, if we have a, an artist that's applied for a grant that's actually thought about that um, and built it into their budget, it's actually really encouraging for us um, and a sign that they've really thought about the lifespan and um, the well-being of the mural over time. So I think that we would, um, for, you know, just depending on the proposal and the application, we would probably tend to um, want to support that um, for sure. And I don't know if anybody from um, BSAA or Alex want to chime in on that. No, nope. I can't answer the next question. <laughs> okay. The fading one. It's the. I, I did you want to answer the question before? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Mm -mm. <laughs> the fading one is reds and yellow red reds and yellows fade first reds especially so it's like red yellow purples blues and then like black and white so that's yep. that's the order of right. fading and funny enough i've heard that reds yellows and oranges are also the hardest colors to paint because they're more translucent than others so um yeah you're gonna definitely need many layers of things uh of paint if you're working uh with reds, yellows, and oranges. So factor that into your paint calculation costs too. All right, uh, folks. Well, we and I see another minutes? question maybe to clarify. Um, so I guess the question about the oil paints um, was more talking about spray paints. So spray paints are more oil-based, yes. Um, and uh, they, they um, you know, different spray paints, like Alex mentioned, um, we didn't really dive into that, but there's art grade spray paint. You can get it at places like Blick or Artists and Craftsman Supply or Columbia Art Supply. Um, you're looking at uh, brands like Montana, uh, 94, Belton, um, things like that. That is important that if you're painting a mural, you should probably be using that. Um, you would not necessarily want to be painting a mural with spray paint that you can buy at a hardware store like Rust-Oleum. Um, people, of course, do use that. Um, it adheres really nicely to metal. Um, so that could be a reason um, to use some of that paint. But um, generally speaking, you want to get the better paint. And if you can, um, order it bulk online because it's a lot cheaper to do that way through directly through some of the companies that are distributing it rather than buying it per can at a local art store. So plan ahead and you can get it a little cheaper. Yeah, hardware store paint, it still lasts. It's pretty good quality, but it's harder to control. Um, and they are like enamel based paint. So enamel based is more oil and it'll, um, it, dry, it takes longer to dry. Yeah. And there's a lot of different caps too. So if you're getting into spray paint, I recommend watching some tutorials. It is not just something intrinsically that comes to us. Um, what's happening there, like I mentioned, it takes many, many years to master the craft of spray painting with uh, a mural. Um, and you would also need a whole arsenal of different caps and understanding what those caps do, um, because that's how these artists are getting all these really cool effects. You're not just using what they call the stock cap that comes on the spray paint. When you buy it, you need extra caps. Okay, we're gonna do one more question <laughs> and we're gonna wrap this up. 
Um, I think this should be an easy one. Is there a, a square feet calculator that is good? Um, sorry, I just lost it. Good to use to help work out um, the paint needed for um, a mural. Hmm. Good question. Um, not that I know of. I know each paint is going to be a different type of calculation, actually. So it's going to be on a per paint basis. So if you're using bucket paint, that has a certain calculation that the the you know, you can look up online or, or the can says. Um, same thing, you can look up online um, how far spray paint's gonna get you. But no too with the artistic grade spray paint that I mentioned, there's different types of spray paint too. There's um, high pressure and low pressure. And that might have a bit of an effect too about how far it gets you. Another thing to factor in is your wall quality. So a really thirsty drywall is gonna suck your paint in a lot faster and you're gonna have to put more coats. If you do a really good job um, priming your wall and prepping it, or if it's in really good shape when you get there, you're gonna need less paint for that too. So there's just a lot of things to kind of factor in um, to try to get that right. Um, I know we talked about, me and Alex talked about this on the side, but we sometimes say like, you know, don't overbuy your paint because that's really expensive. Um, buy pints and quarts if you need just a small quantity of the paint, don't go straight to gallons. Um, and just kind of have a backup plan B that if you need more paint, you know that you can get it um, locally or you have enough time to order it. Um, and also know that there are paint supply shortages um, lately. Um, it was really bad last year. It seems to be getting a little bit better, but across the board, across the world, um, certain pigments and different things were running on really short supply. And um, we were seeing that here locally um, with all of the paint. Uh, providers um, running out of paint. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we won't be uh, dealing with that much more. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I really can't say thank you enough. This has been great. Um, I did just want to say that we have two more workshops as part of the Creative Impact Workshop series. One is called Finding Your Why and What to Do When Your Plan Fails. This is, um, both of these are in April. So that one is on April 21st at 4 p.m. There is a charge, it's $25. And then the second one um, is on April 23rd and that's a teen portfolio review workshop. So those are our two remaining creative impact workshops. Um, and we will be following up with everyone who has registered or who attended um, with a copy of this presentation and the one sheet and um, a link to where you can view um, this session. And um, so I just, you know, if you would like to share it, please do. Um, certainly you can reach out to, um, to me and I'll um, leave my um, email in the chat if you wanna talk about murals in Beaverton, I can certainly, um, field those questions. And um, I would say, I, I think our uh, presenters are open to having questions as well. So um, after the fact, that is, we're gonna wrap this up, but um, yeah, that's it for me. And I um, I just wanna say thanks to Courtney uh, for for helping steer the conversation and the, the, uh, the presentation. Um, and I also just wanted uh, to say thanks for the patience with all of the, the hiccups with the technology um, such as life. So we made it. Um, I still feel like we got so much information and, um, thank you all again, and we'll see you all soon. Take care out there.